Yes. All right, you ready to get started? I'm ready. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Brie Kimberlein. I am a nurse coordinator for North Kansas City Hospitals Health and Wellness Department. Um, today we have a very exciting talk. I've been excited about watching this for weeks now. Um, we have Anne Bethune with us, um, and she's going to talk to us about psychedelics and your mental health. So just a little about Anne. Um, after working for several years providing therapy at a rape crisis center, Anne became trained in ketamine-assisted psychotherapy in 2019, right? 2019? Correct. Yes. Okay. And opened the first um, CAP or ketamine assisted psychotherapy practice in the Midwest. And that capacity has provided hundreds of CAP sessions, including preparation and integration. In early 2022, Anne was hired for a team of lead facilitators on a phase one clinical trial to study psilocybin and continues in that role with a first in human clinical trial of 5-MeO DMT. Um, Anne has traveled to attend psilocybin retreats in Jamaica to deepen her relationship to this plant, as well as obtain further training on providing psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy with an emphasis in end-of-life care. Anything else I'm missing? No, that's it. All right, great. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Anne. We okay. do have the chat open. And we also have the Q&A open, and we will address those at the end of her presentation. So feel free, if you think of something, to drop it in there, and we'll get to you at the end. All right, so take it away, Anne. Okay. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you to North Kansas City Hospital for inviting me to top, talk on this topic. Um, that's about me. Okay. So today, we're going to talk about three medicines. Ketamine, which is legal and available. That's what I'm practicing with now. Psilocybin, which is currently not legal, but there are bills in the Missouri legislature to expand access, and MDMA, which is currently not legal, but there's a um, expectation that it will be rescheduled on the federal level. We're not going to talk about this medicine in any depth, but I did want to mention ibogaine. Ibogaine is a plant medicine that comes from the iboga plant, which is found in Africa. And in naturalistic studies and in treatment centers um, out of the country, it has been found to treat opioid addiction, which if you know anything about it, that's a very difficult addiction to treat. And this plant medicine has shown efficacy with that. Missouri will receive some money from the opioid settlements and there's some interest in Missouri in using some of that money to sponsor, sponsor clinical trials on ibogaine. So it's a long process. It's a long way off. It takes a long time to get these medicines to, to, um, to market. And ibogaine has shown promise where a lot of other treatment options have not. So I did want to mention it. So let's start with ketamine. So that's the medicine I'm currently working with. The applications for ketamine are anxiety, depression, stuckness, self-limiting beliefs, trauma. It's an opportunity for exploration. It works well with rigid thought patterns. The history of ketamine. So ketamine was synthesized in 1956 by Park Davis, which was a big pharmaceutical company. It's classified as a dissociative anesthetic and it can have psychedelic effects. It was a battlefield medication in Vietnam and Afghanistan because it does not recover, re require respiratory support. So you can take the medicine and not need uh, breathing assistance. It's also used in pediatric medicine and vet veterinary medicine. One of the street names for ketamine is Special K and the methods of ingestion are oral, IV, intermuscular, and nasal. I use the oral method. It's a uh, oral preparation that clients self-ingest during, um, during the ketamine session, and it doesn't require medical monitoring. So the ketamine experience, the come on is anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. The psychoactive part of it is one to two hours. You would be lying on a couch with eye shades on. There's curated playlists for the experience. You can have internal visions, 
sensations of moving, floating. You won't have any hallucinations. So if you open your eyes, you will see me in my office. You won't see anything that's not there. It's a very expansive state. So the that state of consciousness is very wide open and expansive. You can encounter some heavy material, some disturbing material, but it's typically at such a level of distance that you're viewing it with a fair amount of detachment and you're not re-experiencing it. And um, in one of the biological properties of ketamine is an increased period of neuroplasticity after the medicine experience. So this is a physiological um, treatment along with psychological. Um, so when you're born, when you're young, you're born with a lot of neurons and they multiply and they grow and they continue to make connections when you're exposed to new things. And then as we age, this process slows down. It never stops, but it does slow down. After a ketamine experience, there's this increased period of neuroplasticity. So I really encourage people to just marinate in that state of neuroplasticity. So what do people say? So I've done probably oh, over 300 CAP sessions. Um, and here's some of the things that clients have said. So it just is. So that's a wonderful, um, just neutral detachment from a situation where it's no longer overtaking you, that the situation can just exist and um, you just make space for it. If you're not careful, you'll miss it. Be present. How much attention do you want to give the BS? Releasing, releasing and processing deep relational trauma. I arrived at a place of deep self-compassion. I could see what I was carrying and what was mine to carry and what wasn't. I can receive the kindness of others. I'm okay. Sometimes by the time people come see me, they have lost any sense of being okay. If they can get a reset, you know, just, hey, I'm okay and I'm going to be okay, that can make a huge difference. Black heavy blankets being lifted off of me one by one. I am not the story I tell myself I am. We all have a story. Sometimes we write our stories. Sometimes um, events write our story. Sometimes our families, our culture, our society write our story. It's really nice when you can get some distance from that story. I can let go of the belief that I'm not good enough. Feelings of acceptance and grace. So psilocybin, so that's magic mushrooms. Applications for psilocybin are addiction, depression, end of life distress, anxiety, trauma, mood disorders, and there's other applications that are currently being studied. Psilocybin is a unique molecule and that it's transdiagnostic. And what that means is it's one medicine that has shown a lot of efficacy treating a number of different mental health presentations. Okay, the history of psilocybin. So psilocybin has been used by humans for millennia. There is ancient art that shows the mushroom, uh, the mushroom itself and the mushroom in ceremony. So it's been around forever. It was studied in the 50s and 60s, and it became illegal in 1970, around the time of the war on drugs. So what is the psilocybin experience? So I have, you know, hundreds of CAP sessions experience, not as much for psilocybin and MDMA, obviously because they're not legal substances. So this will be a little different, but the, the experience itself, here's the arc of the experience. The ascent, you can see zero to 1.5 hours, peak an hour and a half to three and a half hours, descent, three and a half to five hours. So it's about a five hour trip time with some variance. Psilocybin is a non-specific amplifier. So whatever you have going on, it can make it bigger. And that's why it's really important to be with someone that can support you in that. You will or can have visuals. You can see things that aren't there or things that are there can be completely different. It can have psycho-spiritual effects. You can have feelings of oneness, unity, 
connection to nature. You hear people, you've heard of the microdose. Well, there's the hydrodose. That's where you're taking one gram and you're hiking and you're you're vibing with a forest. You can't have a lot of feeling connection to nature with psilocybin. And then um, experiences with ancestors in past lives. Um, what do people say? I felt a huge release of pain and anger was one of the most meaningful experiences in my life. Connection to people I care about. I saw my grandmother, she talked to me. One with nature, a loving godlike presence, unity. I saw what I needed to work on. Okay, MDMA. So the applications for MDMA, starting with PTSD. So there are phase one, two, three studies showing a lot of efficacy with MDMA to treat PTSD. And that's one of the primary reasons it has fast track status because the protocol has worked when a lot of different things haven't worked. It works with couples life-threatening illnesses, social anxiety, and like psilocybin, there's other um, applications that are currently being studied. The history of MDMA. So it was synthesized by Merck in 1912. It was used therapeutically in the 1970s. It became a street drug, party drug in the 80s, known as ecstasy, X, Molly, and it became illegal in 1985. The MDA, MDMA experience. So here you can see the ascent, the peak, the descent, and the total trip time, three to seven hours. And there's it's a wide uh, variety of trip times in there. I've heard up to eight as well. You can have visual distortions like brightness, perceptual changes. Um, you won't see anything that's not there typically, but it can be moving, vibrating, glowing could be closer, further away. You have a loss of sense of time, which is really true of all psychedelics. Changes in the quality of sound and location of sound. So the sound may be echoey or louder or softer, and you may not know where the sound is coming from. Feelings of bliss, insightfulness, enhanced communication, heart opener. MDMA works by increasing the feel-good chemicals in your brain. So that's that's what contributes to that um, communication, the bliss, feelings of bliss. And the come down can be difficult. Serotonin, I mean, the, the medicine depletes serotonin in your body. So later that day or the next day, there's often a feeling of being depleted, similar to a hangover. What do people say? I feel very connected to myself and others. We're all in this together. Feelings of self-love. I understand what joy is now. I feel safe. So as promising as these medicines are, and there is a very robust body of data supporting their safety and efficacy, they are not for everyone. And that's one thing in the Missouri psilocybin bill that I really like. It's a very careful mental health approach. So who's not a good candidate? Um, those taking certain medications. So with ketamine, you can be taking SSRIs. And SSRIs have their limitations. We hear a lot about that. And there are a lot of people that need to stay on their SSRIs to manage their symptoms. So if you're on SSRIs, you would, you, you're not going to be a good candidate for some of these other psychedelic medicines. Psychosis, active mania, instability of personality structure. So the psychedelic experience, it's, um, it's a non-ordinary state of consciousness. It can be fantastical. It can be um, a sense of, of things you will see that, that aren't actually real, that can't be real in this realm. And so you have to have some stability of personality to be able to land back in your body, land back in your life in this sense of reality. And if you have no structure for integration. Um, so, you know, 
it, it's a big, can be a, a really big um, confusing experience. So if you're not in a place of safety, if, for example, if you're experiencing homelessness and don't have stability, psychedelics are not going to be a good choice for you. You need some support structures in place. So this is a unique approach. It's pharmacological, it's psychological, and it's relational, the relationship with the therapist. The process is first the assessment. So the assessment process is to see if this is a good treatment for you and to rule out any things that would not be make this treatment um, appropriate for you. I can tell you with my practice right now with ketamine, I get a lot of clients, well, I get a lot of clients from other therapists and I get clients that self-refer. With ketamine, you can self-refer. I think with MDMA and psilocybin, there's going to be a little bit more of an assessment component to it where you cannot self-refer, but, but we'll see. Then there's preparation session or sessions. I do as many as it takes in my practice. Um, the goal of preparation is for you to know what to expect. What is this going to be like? Um, have you ever experienced something like this so that you're completely prepared for it? I want to know about you. I want to know about your history. I want to know your why. Why are you seeking this treatment? How can I support you? I would teach you some grounding skills in case the, the experience got very big and dysregulated. How can I help you ground in that moment? Um, how can I better serve you? Then you have the medicine session. So that's the supported medicine session. And then um, integration sessions. And we're gonna talk more about integration later. Integration is very important. And then you repeat. So there's certain protocols with, um, with these medicines. Some, some protocols will be, because the, in these have, have they been tested in phase two and three. Sometimes it's one medicine, medicine session. Sometimes it can be up to four. So the number of times you repeat the medicine session, it will depend on what's going on with you, what the medicine is, what the protocol is. So here is a Venn diagram I came up with about a psychedelic therapists and what to look for and what to expect. So the first is education. And again, I go back to the Missouri bill. The Missouri bill for psilocybin, it requires you have to have at least a master's level at, at degree. So with full clinical licensure. So there's the education. Those are the people qualified to work with this medicine that have specific mental health training. Then the clinical skills. So what settings have you worked in? What are your clinical skills? What, what experience you, do you have? And then experience. And, and I would look for years of experience in therapeutic settings in a very a variety of different settings, different populations. For, for mental health, it takes a lot of um, you, it takes a lot of reps. You have to see a lot of different people with a lot of different presentations and and see how they respond and, and get some sense of uh, the variety of arcs of treatment. The last circle is medicine. What does your therapist know about the medicine? Do they have training specific to that medicine? Um, I would want to know their own experience with the medicine. And I know that it would may require disclosing something illegal, but I would want to know that. I would want to know their own experience with the medicine and that have they been in spaces with other people using the medicine and what spaces have those been? Um, and then have they facilitated? So you need uh, training specific to the medicine you're working with. And then the population. So it's really important that you have training and experience with the population you're treating. And podcasts don't count. You need specific training. So for example, PTSD, if someone is presenting for with a trauma diagnosis, what does the therapist know about trauma in the body? What do they know about trauma in the nervous system? What mediates trauma? What are trauma symptoms and presenta presentations? What do they know about relational trauma and complex trauma? Um, substance use disorder, that's one of the things in the Missouri bill. So I work with a lot of people in recovery and that's different. If someone is presenting for treatment with an active addiction, 
I would only work with someone that has a specific credential on that. Addiction is tricky. It, it can be dangerous. And I would only work with someone that really knows that population. Um, treatment resistant depression. Unfortunately, everyone in mental health has experience working with that. End of life. Um, end of life is a beautiful, sacred, tender time. And I would want to work with someone that has specific training and experience with working with people and their families at that time. There are populations, there are mental health populations that if you don't have that specific training, you will cause harm. And then the importance of the therapeutic relationship. When you take a medicine, you are surrendering to a process. In a lot of ways, you're incapacitated your ability to communicate and move around, your mobility is going to be compromised. You want to know that the person working with you is attuned to you, that they can be with you, they can tolerate all the bigness of the experience, and that you feel safe. This is a medicine of the mind. So you have to have in your mind that you can be cared for by the person that's working with you. In psychedelics, you hear a lot about set and setting. Um, set is your mindset. That's your life experiences, your values, your identities, your cultural perspectives, assumptions, expectations, fears, concerns. All that should come up in the preparation sessions. That's what you show up with on that day of the medicine experience, and it will influence your experience. And then the setting is the physical environment. Who's present? Um, there's some people that do group work. Group work can be very enhancing or it can be intimidating or, or um, some, somehow interfere with your process. Everyone in the room will affect your experience. The medicine itself, music, often for these experiences, there's curated playlists for the experiences. Lighting, it's, it's generally a, a subtle, um, gentle place blankets, eye shades, and everything in that is in the psychedelic is, is referred to as the container. So that's the physical and mental space where the medicine experience is happening. So how does this work? How is this different? What the medicine does is it disrupts your default mode network. And it also has properties of neuroplasticity and neural connectivity. Your default no, me, node me, mode network is your ingrained ways of thinking, feeling, perceiving, responding. It's how you think about the past and future. And often these, these thoughts in, in our default way of thinking does not serve us. Sometimes we respond disproportionately to things. Sometimes we're triggered by things and our reaction is not appropriate for the situation. So this can be limiting, and that's why it's good to, to go past that. Psychedelics can facilitate a top-down or bottom-up experience. In mental health, that means top-down is cognitive. So that's your thoughts. And then bottom-up is if you think of the worst thing that's ever happened to you, you may recall a feeling in your throat or your chest or your abdomen. Our, our brains are in our skull, but our mind is throughout our body and our body can get triggered and have these, these kind of gut punch feelings and reactions to things. And psychedelics works with that bottom up processing. They cause a state of expansiveness. So rather than all that, you know, history and, and you know, default network being all compressed together, there's an expansiveness in the space. So what do people experience? So here are some things that come up. Reappraisal of values and meaning, connection to a larger world, universe, humanity, deity, nature, religious or moral inquiry, distance from self-limiting beliefs, thoughts, stories, shadow, repressed aspects of self, we all have parts of self that we don't want to identify with. We want to keep them suppressed. They may be wrapped up in shame or guilt or feelings of unworthiness. 
And in our waking lives, it's really easy. It's well, it's not easy. It's possible to repress that. It takes a lot of effort and it's still there. It's still going to affect how you how you move through the world. The medicine will not allow you to continue to repress that. And it's not pleasant to deal with shadow work. It is very healing. And that's one of the beautiful things of, of the medicine experience. And again, why you want why you want qualified people to be with you in that experience. You get cognitive insights, emotional breakthroughs, mystical experiences, psycho-spiritual exploration, and energetic release. So what do you do with that? That's good stuff. And what do you do with that information? How does that lead to transformation? Well, that is called integration. And there, I have a definition there of integration that you can read, but there's nothing magic about magic mushrooms. You have to do the work. You have to have the medicine experience and then integrate it. There's research stating that the benefits of a psychedelic experience may last three months without integration and over 13 months with integration. Integration practice is individual. It only has to make sense to you. There's no recipe. You will want support with integration and an integration plan. And there's many therapeutic interventions that work well with integration. So here's something, oh, here's another thing on the importance of integration. So the medicine experience is 1%, integration is 99%. And I love this quote, the end of ceremony is just the beginning of many long ordinary days of extraordinary practice. And this is something that comes up in preparation. So, so you prepare someone, they know that they're not done after the, the medicine experience. So, um, so this is something I do in my ketamine practice. I don't, um, this is not a comprehensive integration plan. This is an invitation I extend to clients right away to come up with a remembrance of their experience and a practice. So I'm gonna share two examples of the remembrance and I have permission from both of these clients to share. So everything that happens in the psychedelic space is in another realm. It's not tangible. It's happening somewhere else. When you come back, you're just gonna be back in this, this space and this body and, and everything, whatever is here is here. Um, so I invite people to come up with a physical representation of their experience, something solid, something tangible in their environment that they cannot help but see every day. So I have a little fawn here. So in a psychedelic experience, um, there's kind of a flow to it. And there's these different like themes and scenes and it changes throughout the experience. I worked with a woman and throughout her trip, the scene would change, but then on the periphery of every scene, no matter what it was, was a little fawn and it was just kind of out there. She noticed it, but didn't make connection with it. And the scene would change and it would be there again. And it just went throughout the trip. And then at the end of her trip, the um, it was just her and the fawn. And the fawn came to her and she recognized the, th the fawn as a younger wounded part of herself. And she was able to embrace the fawn and nurture the fawn and the fawn nurtured her. And it was so beautiful and healing. So she got herself a little plastic fawn that she puts where she gets ready every day and she can't help but see it. And then the, the crane, um, I'm working with a young man. He's very interesting. He's very cool. Like he has all these things that he likes that are creative things, artistic things, nature someone with a, you know, a very curious mind. And when you're depressed, you can't access that. You can't access even things that used to love, things that used to excite you. Um, you know, the, the depression just kind of pins you down. So he had a cap experience and he sat up and ketamine is a prescription medicine and it comes with that, you know, insert that all prescription medicines come with. He just picked up the insert 
and he folded it and made an origami crane. And while he was doing it, he talked about all the things he used to make and all the shapes he could do and all the animals he could do. And, and that's his remembrance that, that I still have that. I can still access this interesting, beautiful part of myself. So psychedelics can remind people how awesome they are. And that's his remembrance. Um, okay, so, and then the other invitation I make which is a practice, it's not the whole integration plan, is a, a, a practice. So something you can do every day um, to do, um, just to remind you of your experience. It has to be sustainable. You know, some people say, oh, they'll do yoga or they're journaling or they're gonna go for a run. Well, guess what? I'm not doing any of those things. So I work with people to find something that works for them, that's sustainable. And it just has to be something brief that they can do every day. And we really work on that. We really try to find what can you do? It can be going outside, looking at the night sky, companion animals, spending time with a companion animal. There's, there's been all kinds of things. Some people it comes up a lot, which is interesting to me is people like, I'm gonna make my bed every day. So we work on that. Just some small practice that you can do daily and, um, that reminds you and keeps you connected to your experience. And I tell people it's like recovery. In recovery, they say it only works if you work it. And that's true of all integration. So more on integration. So homeostasis is the state of, of steady conditions within a system. Systems like homeostasis. You are a system. Your system includes your body, your relationships, your work, your environment, your culture, society, patterns, and habits. So, um, so you need to integrate your insights, your behavioral shifts, your cognitive shifts into your system, or you will drift back to baseline. Systems like homeostasis. So that, that's why having an ally in mental health is gonna be helpful to you and know that your system has to be modified a bit or it will go back to how it's always functioned. Integration is ongoing, it's a lifestyle. So with psychedelic medicine, it's called a trip. You go there and you come back. You don't move there, you don't live in that space. You go there and you come back and you integrate it. All our indicators of well-being are in this realm. This is where we live. This is where we work. This is where our relationships are. This is where we experience our bodies. So you have to, it, to integrate all those things into your system. So, um, so what's next? What medicines? How are we going to get access to these other medicines? Ketamine is great. Um, ketamine is a good treatment for a lot of people. And these other medicines have shown greater efficacy and real promise to treat the mental health crisis. So let's start with the path to access. So one path is federal rescheduling. And so the DEA has five categories of um, scheduling. It's called scheduling. Schedule one, which is where psilocybin and MDA, MDMA are street drugs. These are uh, substances where the, the FDA and DEA have determined that they have no therapeutic value and that they're unsafe. The federal government can reschedule these medicines, which make them available for therapeutic use. That is done by clinical trials. So all you hear about these clinical trials, these are companies gathering data to submit to the FDA on rescheduling so they can reschedule these medicines. It's anticipated that MDMA will be rescheduled this year. And I've been hearing that exact same thing since 2022, but we'll see. I know that there is a lot of data supporting rescheduling of MDMA. States can pass legislation to expand access. And there are two bills in the Missouri legislature right, right now to expand access to psilocybin. So about clinical trials. So when a plant medicine is being studied, the substance used is a replica of the psychoactive molecule. So when I did the clinical trials on psilocybin, it was not a mushroom. It was um, a synthesized product. Uh, clinical trials phase one, is it safe? 
Phase two, does it work? Phase three, is it better than something else? Phase four, what can we still learn? So this is a long, long, expensive process. And it contributes to the development of pharmaceutical products and the application of psychedelic medicines. And it's more likely to be covered by insurance plans if it's FDA approved. In fact, I can say with a high degree of confidence that it's unlikely that your insurance plan will co uh, cover something that's not FDA approved. There's a lot of the um, people in the psychedelic space that don't like that it's been medicalized and that big pharma is involved. And I, I empathize with that. I appreciate that point of view. And that's the only way that most people are going to be able to safely access this medicine is, is if it is rescheduled, FDA approved, and um, available through an insurance plan. So here's the Missouri Capitol. 2024 is the third year in a row where psychedelic bills have been introduced. They haven't passed the past two years. It's a process. Every session, even if a bill doesn't pass, there's more members of the General Assembly that are learning about this, that are hearing about how it can address our mental health crisis, that are getting some exposure to the data to support this. They hear testimony from people in the field uh, that have experience and either clinical experience or personal experience or research experience with these medicines. So it's a long process. There's a house bill you can see, it's 1830, sponsored by Aaron McMullen, came out of the Veterans Committee, um, a Senate bill 768, sponsored by Senator Holly Thompson Rader out of the Emerging Issues Committee. Um, I like, what I really like about the Missouri bill, it's a mental health bill in response to a mental health crisis. So the Missouri bills are calling for um, licensed clinician, medical or mental health clinicians with full clinical licensure to work with this medicine. I contrast that with Oregon. In Oregon, the bill that was passed in Oregon to work with psilocybin, to work with the medicine, here's the requirements. 21 years old, high school graduate, resident of the state, and a 120 hour training course. And 36 of those hours are non-clinical content. So Missouri is taking a very measured, cautious, safe, therapeutic approach. What's in the bill? Um, okay, so there's four diagnoses that are named, PTSD, major depressive disorder, substance use disorder, and end of life care. I do end of life work with medicine. It's, it's really a beautiful application for this medicine. There's also money in both bills for clinical research. So that'll be clinical research that happens. It would be great if it happened in Kansas City, um, but wherever it happens in Missouri, there'll be Missourians who may be eligible to participate in clinical trials and receive free treatment of this medicine. And the last thing in the bill, and this is last because this was language that was recently added to the bill. A couple of weeks ago, I testified in the House Committee for this bill, the Veterans Committee about the bill. And then after I testified, it was, um, we learned that um, language was added in the bill to limit this, to limit psilocybin assisted therapy to only Missouri veterans. Last week, I testified in the Senate committee along with one of the powerful voices from veterans' mental health who pushed back against this limitation rather forcefully. So that's another reason to thank of that. And the language is still in the bill. So this, as the bill stands right now, that will be limited to Missouri veterans. Um, and that was a disappointment to a lot of people. What can you do? So Bree, maybe you can drop these in the chat. Um, so what can you do? You're a Missourian, you're a constituent, your voice matters. This, this issue is important to a lot of people. So the first link there, that's the legislative lookup link. So if you go to that link, you have a House rep and a Senate rep. You enter your information in there and you will get the names and contact information of your House rep, 
and your Senate rep. The next link is Senator Rader. She's the sponsor of the bill in the Senate. And the link after that is the um, Representative McMullen who sponsors the bill in the House. Email them, thank them for their sponsorship if you're in favor of this. Let them know what you feel about the language in the bill. Do you support that? Do you, do you wanna see more access? Let them know uh, your feelings on the bill. And so that's four emails. That's one to your house rep, one to your senator, one to the Senate sponsor of the bill, and one to the house sponsor of the bill. Make your voice heard if this is important to you. And the last thing is uh, Psychedelic Missouri. This is the best place for information on how this issue is moving through the legislature and really all things psychedelic in Missouri. Um, this is not a partisan issue, but it is a political process. We have engaged, competent, informed lobbying on this effort in Jeff City, and it takes resources. Psychedelic Missouri has a donate button. If you're inclined, donate. If not, at a minimum, sign up to get the update so you know how this issue is progressing. Um, also, another thing, I mentioned Ibogaine. So there's no pending legislation on Ibogaine. But if Ibogaine treatment for opioid addiction is on your radar, I would get it on your rep's radar in a separate email. Don't put it in any of these emails because it will get lost. But if that's something that's important to you, let them hear from you and let them hear from you periodically because you know this is a very difficult addiction to treat and this is a promising um, medicine to treat it. And like I said earlier, it takes a long time to get these medicines to market. So let's get started on it. So I have time left for questions. Um, and if there's a question that you want to ask that uh, you don't want to ask in a public setting, I um, just email me. Um, my contact information is available. All right. So we have what a treatment with which enhances neuroplasticity be good for someone following a stroke? You know, there is studies for that. Um, there, it, and I have worked with someone following a stroke. So my, um, you know, I'm not working with ketamine in a medical model, but I have worked with someone for depression because that's a very, you know, there's there's a lot of losses associated with a stroke. Um, but there is research that it's being studied on that with psilocybin, ketamine. I'm not sure about MDMA, but yes, it's promising. Neuroplasticity, that's what you, you know, that's what you lose in a stroke. So yeah. Are any of the insurance companies considering paying for these treatments? No, they're not. They're, so um, the MDMA and psilocybin are not FDA approved. So they're not going to, I mean, they're not going to, there is a woman that uh, she's a lawyer at UMKC School of Law and her whole specialty of practice is getting these, um, these treatments. They're kind of outside of the traditional Western medical model approved by insurance. Um, so that's going to be a process. It's going to start with the FDA, with FDA approval, and then it's just going to take some advocacy and, um, you know, I want to support that. You know, I don't mind being the guinea pig to be the one, like, let's see if we can get this started. Let's see if we can get this approved. Um, you know, insurance companies are looking at a bottom line and there's going to be plenty of data to support the efficiency and efficacy of these treatments to keep people out of the hospital off of some of these long-term medications. So that again is a process and I'm hopeful. It's a long process and I am hopeful. Um, Michael left a comment, interesting integration stories. I think he's referring to um, maybe the fawn and the, the crane. Um, the fawn was very interesting to me. I think that was touching. I could see how that could be your little wounded self and caring for them mm -hmm. would heal you. I think that's a beautiful concept. Um, they also said, I think we may all need a ketamine treatment before this election year is over. And I would agree. Yeah. 
What color? Come on down. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, um, so you you dropped a, um, a couple of the politicians' emails in there. Um, on that one website, is there any kind of template to send to your senator or your congressman? I feel for me, people say that stuff and it's like, okay, well, what should I say to sound professional, especially in a topic like this? Well, I would say this. Well, first of all, where are you with the issue, right? If you're in favor of passing these bills, reference those bills. Say, I, I want to urge you to support whatever bill. And um, and then if there's language in the bill that um, that you you know want to add that you don't like, say, just say it. You know, it, it sounds like an intimidating process, but it's not as uh, sophisticated as you would think. And they they want to hear from regular people. So just I would keep it somewhat brief. You know, you don't need to go into to length, but, you know, just thank you. I like this. I don't like this. Please do this. Keep it simple. Um, and I might. I might um, suggest to the um, to the the uh, psychedelic Missouri for a template, but you know, say what you think. Your opinion matters, and, and talk to people in your household. It's been three years in a row that nothing has passed, despite all the research supporting this. So, if if this is something you care about, let them know. And if you have other people that care about that this issue. Um, tell them to let people know. What do you have to say to people that maybe are, I think maybe this might be a generational thing too, that maybe overcoming that stigma associated with those, those medications? Uh, yeah. And, and you know what, that's, that's something I really like about this process in Missouri, that it is not a adult use um, it is so measured and, and safe. So, um, you know, there, there are people that, um, that aren't, you know, that, that have in, in the war on drugs, you know, there was a lot of propaganda associated with that. So, um, you know, the data supports that. And I think, uh, psychedelic Missouri does have research articles on there and, in this bill, like I'm a licensed professional, I'm not going to do anything that um, that I know is unsafe or, or not efficacious. And in as a business model, I can't, you know, it's not sustainable for me to to promote something that's that's not effective and not safe. Um, there's a lot, you know, in, in Denver this summer, there was I don't know thousands and thousands of people that attended the psychedelic science conference and this you know there's all kinds of podcasts and streaming everything you know this this is a issue that is being looked at again and is it's very data driven so i would just just go with that you know i would just um Push you know the yeah i mean and the science is solid you know having been involved in a clinical trial i was working on a trial and you know, it's very precise. It's, um, it's, you know, it's just very precise and it, it's, there's so many people looking at it and with a skeptical eye, you know, you have to prove it. So this is not, this is not the kind of 60s, 70s, you know, get high, drop out, whatever thing. This is, this is a, a, a therapeutic model and particularly in Missouri, the Missouri approach is is really encouraging. You touched on end of life. What is your experience on how that's benefiting someone at that stage? Um, well, you, I have some, um, if you go to my website, KP Kansas City on my blog, there's a, a story about that. You know, it's, um, it's all so unique. Um, it helps sometimes with death acceptance. It helps sometimes with, um, I, I've had an experience with someone in the, the CAP experience where he, um, he got to have an experience of a life he'll never have. His chemotherapy treatment made him infertile. He, he's passed 
recently. Um, but in his experience, he his wife was expecting and it was so lovely. It was so beautiful. It, it's, you know, attached to a lot of grief because he didn't get to have that. But he was in that space. Uh, there's a, um, a one of the big East Coast cancer hospitals has a measure on the there's a uh, factors that influence a desire for a hastened death. And they're kind of psycho-spiritual, despair, depression, psilocybin and ketamine, but psilocybin in particular can address those so that you, you're you still scared. You still have an end of life diagnosis and you can get some peace about it and not cling to this idea, this, this desire for a hasten death. You can be where you are now with a little bit of peace. So it's been really beautiful. It's very touching, beautiful. Um, you know, there's the psycho-spiritual aspect of it, of having a sense of something eternal, something that's going to survive the body, which is really nice for the family. Um, so I, I wrote about it in one of my experiences in a blog post and um, it, it's gorgeous. You know, it's really gorgeous. Right. Well, I think that's all the questions we have. Is there anything else you want to add, Anne? No, but thank you. And I, I really encourage everyone to, um, if you have some opinions on this, if you're in favor of it, let your voices be heard. They matter. You know, sometimes we lose sight of that, but it, it does matter. So uh, make yourself heard. Well, I thank you so much for sharing your time today. Um, I learned a lot. Um, so please visit Anne's websites. They're listed there on your screen. So capkansascity.com and psychedelictherapykc.com. Um, if you've registered for this presentation, um, you'll be receiving an email from me uh, with a little follow-up information as well. Um, and again, for other great presentations, just as you witnessed, please go to nkch.com backslash class. And we have a lot of other great content on there. So um, I know we had some tragic events that happened here in Kansas City yesterday. So I encourage you to take care of yourself and one another. Um, there is the, uh, the mental health crisis line called 988. You dial that instead of 911 and that'll connect you to a mental health professional. So um, yeah, take care of yourselves. All right. And thanks again. Thank you. I'll see you next time. Okay, great. Thanks. Bye-bye.